name is Michael Glickman. I'm the president and CEO. This institution, for those of you who don't know, is New York's Holocaust Memorial Museum. We are the second largest Holocaust museum in this country and the third largest in the world. The evening that we are presenting tonight is especially meaningful for me because not all that long ago I had the opportunity to meet Pincus before we got a chance to meet him earlier this evening and for those of you who will be around after to meet him in New Dimensions and Testimony. And one of the things I am most excited about is how we get to work with Heather and her colleagues and be able to present the story of Pincus and other survivors. This institution has really set about to change the way in which people talk about the Holocaust, how we educate the future, how we are working with students. We're seeing over 60,000 public school students who are walking through our doors. Nearly two million people have come across this institution. We literally are celebrating uh, almost to the day. We dedicated this institution on September 11th, 1997. So 20 years ago yesterday, we dedicated this museum. <clears throat> And as we sit here on New York Harbor and we look out at the Statue of Liberty in Ellis Island, and to our north we look at the, uh, the new World Trade Center and the Freedom Tower, it's really quite meaningful and poignant for us to be able to be in such an important part of this city. And so we are really quite appreciative that you all are with us this evening. I am going to turn it over to our friend and a representative from USC, Janie Perlstein, who's going to say a few words, and then we're going to get into the program. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Janie Perlstein. I am the Managing Director of Advancement for the USC Shoah Foundation based here in New York. And we are thrilled to be here. Um, it's interesting because this is not the first time that we've partnered with the museum. In fact, back in the 90s when Steven Spielberg started the Shoah Foundation, the Museum of Jewish Heritage was one of the five leading Holocaust research centers that was designated as a repository for the testimonies. So all of the testimonies were housed here almost 25 years ago. And soon the museum will also be a visual history archive site, meaning that you'll be able to come here and watch all 55,000 of our testimonies. And of course that will take about 13 years from start to finish, but you can certainly come and, and, and see clips of the testimonies. But tonight we're here to talk about new dimensions and testimony. And we are thrilled about this new project. Um, it's a project that has won many awards, including the Interactive Award and the Audience Award at the Sheffield Documentary Festival. And some of you may also have seen that it was featured about a year or so ago on the Today Show. Um, new Dimensions and Testimony was introduced officially to the public in 2015 at the Illinois Holocaust Museum. Since then, we have conducted pilots at the U.S. Holocaust Museum in Washington, the Candles Museum in Terre Haute, Indiana, the Sarah and Chaim Neuberger Holocaust Education Center in Toronto, and the Holocaust Museum in Houston. But tonight is our premier pilot in New York City, and we couldn't ask for a better partner than the Museum of Jewish Heritage. Currently, we have 13 testimonies that were filmed as part of this project including a survivor of the Nanjing Massacre, and to date, more than 50,000 questions have been asked of survivors who were interviewed for the project. USC Shoah Foundation has long recognized the value for students to meet and talk to Holocaust survivors. There's nothing better or more important than meeting a survivor in person. However, we know that in the not too near future, that won't be possible. We also know that having students directly interact with survivors help them deal with issues in their own lives, such as bullying and hatred, discrimination, immigration, and anti-Semitism. So what New Dimensions in Testimony means is that one day, whether you're in a museum, you're sitting in a, an institution of learning, or you're at your home, you will be able to interact with Holocaust survivors for generations to come. Through our pilots, we have found that the interaction through New Dimensions and Testimony helps audiences to realize positive outcomes that are consistent with our theory of change, which basically states that engaging with testimonies, people gain understanding and skills that motivate and inspire them to be more responsible citizens in society. 
And now tonight, I'm thrilled to introduce our panelists. You, as you um, heard, Michael, who um, is the CEO and president of the museum, will be the moderator. And we're thrilled to have our superstar, we call him our rock star, um, here for a not a virtual, but a real interview. And if you haven't met him already, this is, is Pincus Guder, who gave us his traditional testimony um, in 1993 in Toronto. And then Pincus was chosen to be the first person to test drive our new technology, new dimensions and testimony. On three separate occasions, he traveled to Los Angeles where he sat in a dome lit by 6,000 LED lights surrounded by 52 cameras. The lights were so blinding that he had to wear protective glasses when he wasn't being filmed. He had to wear the same clothes for days and sit in the same position to maintain the continuity of the project. And I'm sure you'll hear more about this experience directly from our rock star. And in addition to Pincus, we're thrilled to have with us on the panel, Heather Mayo. Heather's company, Conscious Display, for the past 15 years has specialized in exhibition design and interactive digital storytelling. At the heart of their philosophy is creating deep engagement with the story through user-led immersive environments. Heather came to the Showa Foundation with an idea, a vision, and together we found a way to make her vision a reality. She's been producing New Dimensions and Testimony for the past eight years through a collaboration <coughs> with both the USC Showa Foundation and the USC's Institute for Creative Technologies. And with that, our panel. Thank you, Janie. And thank you again for being here. I, at one point, just to pick up on what Janie said, uh, in just a few short weeks, this space, you are in the Morris and Fanny Pickman Keeping History Center, will be the point of destination for the Shoah Foundation testimonies, 54,000 of those, along with another 4,400 testimonies that we've worked in partnership with the Fortunoff Archive at Yale, the Blavatnik Family Archive, and a series of others. This destination here in New York will be the single largest point of access to survivor, eyewitness, and liberator testimonies anywhere. And we are really quite, we're, we're in awe by the opportunity, I think, to work with folks like Pincus to be able to present these stories, but really to meet survivors on a day-to-day -day basis and to be able to help put their stories in front of school children and adults and visitors alike. And so I encourage those of you who are in New York to come back as often and as regularly as you can. And with that, I thought it would be helpful just to give the audience a little bit of an understanding of you, Pincus. And so um, I'm going to do something that I did earlier today with you. We had a great conversation that you don't know about yet uh, when we, we were in the Rotunda Gallery. And so would you, would you tell everybody the, just the facts of your story? Would you give them the abridged version of of really the experience, the remarkable experience that you went through. Your five minutes summary. And as Heather says, <laughs> five in minutes. five minutes or less. <laughs> five minutes can be a hell of a long time. Yeah. <laughs> we can go with three minutes. Uh, um, I was born in, in Wuj, Poland, uh, into a Hasidic family, Gera Hasidim. I'm sure a lot of you know who the Gera Hasidim are. And, um, I had a twin sister, and we were just uh, the four of us, my father, mother, and the my twin sister. My mother didn't have children after that. And uh, I had a very happy childhood. I, uh, I was uh, eight years old when the war started, but then at that time, I started, uh, you know, Cheder when I was three years old, and by the time I was five, I knew the Chumash almost off by heart because we had the Chumash Seder and my grandfather, you know, took all his friends and on Saturday afternoon, they put me on the table. I was a little boy and uh, I had to tell, he, he had to ask me, he asked me questions from the Torah and I had to answer what's the, what happened with Moshe Rabbeinu, what happened here, what happened there, and I had to know it all off by heart. And by that time, I could actually read and write both Polish and, 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 and uh, Yiddish. So we started our education very early. And um, we had a wine concern. We had cellars in 
in, in, in Wuj, in Novomieska number 19, and we were winemakers all over, our wines were being sold all over Poland, and we also had the, the concession from Stock Brandies, I'm sure, which still exists today, it's an Austrian company, and they still make liqueurs and brandies, and we had their sole franchise for Poland. So we, we were winemakers, according to my grandfather, um, we were winemakers in Poland for over 400 years. Um, it, what's very interesting is that he had a parchment, a, a genealogical kind of parchment in which the history of the Gutter family and other uh, uh, Buchweiz family from my grandmother's side were all listed. And according to him, it was 400 years. And occasionally on a Saturday afternoon when we used to come to get from him like peyrot, you know, fruit or sweets, he would take it out. He had a special uh, baroque kind of uh, beautiful uh, um, armoire and he would take it out and show it to us. And this is my life before the war. And it all changed in 1939 when the Germans arrived in Wuj. And within a few days, uh, they came within, I think, within six, seven days. They were already in Wuj, and the and, and the um, Wuj had uh, over 100,000 ethnic Germans. So the fifth column, they were very, very uh, uh, active in, in in Wuj. They told everybody the the, Ger the security service who came behind, who, what, and when, and they had lists. They went around. They were looking for my grandfather. My father was ill. My grandfather was ill, so he came to, they came to his uh, apartment. We had joined the apartment with the interleading door. Uh, my father opened the door. The war was still raging, and he was at home. Nobody was working. They asked him what's the matter with my grandfather. He told them, he, so they left him. They took my father down to the cellars. They beat him almost to death, and they destroyed the whole cellars, took out over 11,000 bottles of wine and destroyed all the vets and everything. And then we ran away to Warsaw. To cut a long story short, we spent two and a half years in the Warsaw from 1940 to 19, well actually longer, 19, we were in, not in the ghetto, but because at the beginning, the ghetto was only closed in August uh, or no, September or November of 19, uh, 40, but we arrived there at the beginning of 1940. So we were in Warsaw for about three and a half years. I was there until the uprising. We were in a bunker. We were discovered three weeks after the uprising started. They took us to Majdanek. In Majdanek, I lost my parents and my twin sister. And then I went through another five concentration camps. I was in Buchenwald in Skarżysko, in Częstochowa, on a death march to Czechoslovakia from, from, from Kolditz, which was in Germany. And that's how I spent the years of, uh, the five years. I was under the yoke of the Nazis for, for the whole five years since, you know, the war started. Pinkus, when was the first time that you told your story publicly? I, I, you know, I never spoke publicly for a long, long time. The first time that I actually agreed to tell my story was not um, uh, publicly. It was, there was a professor, a history professor in Toronto, because we emigrated to Toronto in 1985, and she was taking testimonies of people. Her name was Paula Draper. And she tried very hard to get me to, to tell my story. And I didn't want to, and I didn't want to. Eventually, she, came, she asked me whether she'd come to tea. And I said, yes. So we had tea. And then eventually, she did four hours of my testimony. And I gave it to my children. That's when they learned. They knew I was a Holocaust survivor, but they didn't know my stories. And this, I gave it to my children. So this is the first time I actually spoke about it. And then subsequently, um, in 1997 or 98, I met Stephen Smith, who was the consultant when they created the Holocaust Center in Cape Town. And Stephen took my testimony. And the testimony that he took, I still regard today as the most important of all. Because somehow or other, we uh, the empathy and the kind of the flow of emotion between the two of us 
was so great that I could unburden myself and speak in such a, in such a way where I look at that, I, can, I really feel it, that that is the most important one of the love. And it was Stephen Smith that got me involved in the work of the Shoah Foundation. We became very close friends. And I've been working, and then I started there's in this room, there's Ellie Rubinstein, who is, uh, you know, uh, the director of the March of the Living in Toronto. He got me involved in going to, um, to Poland and uh, Germany with uh, mainly Christian people because I said, if I'm going to go on the March of the Living or March of... So my first trip was with Catholic educators from the College of St. Elizabeth, Seton Hall, and others. And uh, that was in 2005. And after that, I started speaking in public. But the real, the re what really, what was cathartic for me was meeting Stephen and getting involved with the Shaw Foundation. Uh, Stephen made me go and take my whole family to Poland. And he made a film for BBC Midland or something called The Void. And, um, it was very emotional. You can imagine, it's the first time I went back after 53 years to Poland. I didn't want to go, but I wanted to say Kaddish in Majdanek, when the Mount of Ashes is where the open grave of my family. And I wanted to say Mullah Rahmin. So I, 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 you know, it was really very, very important for me to be there with my whole family. And it, it, and it, was, it kind of opened up, and Stephen and the Shaw Foundation persuaded me to get involved in a, on a much larger kind of plane working and to try and educate people and talk about what happened and get involved with the hologram, with other, uh, I, there was a film, Politische, po Politische Polish Jude, made by the Hebrew University in Jerusalem uh, as a couple of years ago, which was uh, premiered and uh, shown on television and all over. It's actually on the, on the, on the internet if you want to see it. Just go to Politische Polish Jude and you can get much more of, of, what I'm to, of my story. And you can actually see in situ where I was because we went for 10 days with a crew from Israel and they were filming me and talking for me where all those places where I went to Buchwald and, and everywhere else. In the last goodbye. A big one? The last goodbye. The last goodbye. Uh, well, and then, of course, uh, uh, there was no end to it. Uh, you know, once they start with you, they never let you go. So, uh, so in, in 2016, I was taking a group of teachers, which is sub subsidized by the uh, Canadian government once a year by the, the Holocaust Foundation in, in, in Toronto. So I was, this was in August, so Stephen phoned me and said, listen, by the way, we want to do a... Virtual reality. What? Virtual, virtual reality. Yeah, a virtual reality film of you in Majdanek. So we spent three days, and it was very difficult, but apparently it is... Uh, it, it is it's, well, I saw it here at the Trabeca. There was, it was shown at the Trabeca Film Festival, and I, I saw it for the first time. And uh, really, it, 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 it's... It came, it, it's something very important. It's, I think it's, it's both the hologram and that, but if you really want to know, if you want to feel what it meant to arrive in Majdanek without going there, if you put on those goggles and the, and the earphones and you actually go through and look at this and follow me in Majdanek as I tell what happened when we arrived there and where I was and where I worked and what happened to me in that I was there from... May to the end of July, to 1st of August. It was Tisha B'Av. I, I remember things in Hebrew, in the Hebrew calendar, but I, I didn't remember. Because regardless of anything, let me tell you that in the camps, we always kept our holidays. So we always knew, the, at least I knew the calendar. I was a little boy, so I didn't know anything about the dates. But I knew when it was Rosh Hashanah, I knew when it was Yom Kippur, I knew when it was Tisha B'Av. And... Another reason why I knew it was Tisha B'Av, that whenever Tisha B'Av happened, the Nazis did the most terrible things. Specifically, Tisha B'Av was a, one of their favorite places. So when I was in Skarzysko, when we were leaving that camp, because the Russians were coming and they had the last election, it was Tisha B'Av. And that's when the Nazi murderers 
they chose me to die. And a Jewish policeman, because the internal administration was run by Jews, saved my life. So, and the Reboi Shalom helped. It, I mean, it was incredible how, how this, these things happened. You know, but I don't, so there, there you are. So if you, if, you go to, if you go to look at this virtual reality it was done, made by the Shoah Foundation, uh, you, you can actually follow a, a Holocaust survivor being there and being with him in that camp and experiencing his emotions and his feelings, which I think is very important that every Holocaust survivor that he tells his story, part of him comes with that. So I was going to ask Heather <laughs> why Pincus was, uh, was asked to be the first participant of this, uh, but I think we all know. I mean, the story is really quite remarkable, so thank you, Pincus. Yeah. <laughs> So Heather, tell us a little bit. Tell us a little bit about how we got to this point where new dimensions became, where you envisioned this and it it, it came to a reality. It's a long time coming. It's eight years ago, and we didn't we didn't when we first started this journey we didn't know if it would actually work, and if the vision would actually be seen, but. Um, we started in 2010 with a concept that um, basically I couldn't imagine a world where my grandchildren wouldn't be able to ask a Holocaust survivor a question. And it's that personal, it's the user-led education that that personal question, what's on my mind, that I wanted to know from them that builds that connection and makes that, that history really come to life personally. So we just, you know, the entire field has been wondering what's going to happen when, God forbid, we have no Holocaust survivors to actually speak to the public in, in person. And so we sat, sat down with the Shoah Foundation and said, there's got to be a way with all the technology that is coming to bear on the world back in 2010, that we can at least replicate some of that. We would never replace them, obviously, but at least we can somewhat replicate that discussion, that Q&A that happens that's so important. I was sharing with Heather and, and Pincus uh, a little while ago that this morning I was in there with a the guest of the museum mm -hmm. and I asked Pincus a question and he answered it so beautifully that this man had tears in his eyes and he said, I could not bear to ask a question like that to a survivor. Mm -hmm. And I think part of what I understand in the conversation that we've had with the Shoah Foundation and with others is that Part of this experience actually helps people have conversations with survivors in a way that, that really helps them get a better understanding of the complexities of what they went through and the like. So Pincus, uh, do you have a, a standout experience? You've been all over the place. This has started to make its way. What stands out for you in terms of being able to uh, have people experience you in in a technological way, and then sort of meet you in person? Well, you know, it, it's very uh, different when you interact with a, you know, on, on with the new dimensions and when you speak, you know, publicly by yourself. But it, what is interesting is that I was in Sheffield and I was standing on the side when people were asking, you know, questions to my alter ego there, <laughs> and, um, and, and uh, they were getting emotionally involved. And I was very surprised because, you know, they were kind of speaking to, uh, to me as if I was, you know, in, in, in there. And then somebody turned around and next saw me there. So they said, oh, I was just speaking to you, and now <laughs> you're here. And um, they asked me one or two questions, and I, and I actually felt that, to me, I, I really feel there may be a lot of, some people may, may, may feel that this is not as valid as it's supposed to be, but I personally feel that 
the interaction that you have with the hologram, to me, is so virtually real that you can actually get the same emotional experience and empathy towards that person as if you were speaking to him privately. Because I, I, I got the kind of the feelings of both from you know, speaking to people of just being. I mean, I was walking in Sheffield in the street. We went to see a film. And suddenly, somebody comes across and says, I was just speaking to you. Is that you? <laughs> and, and then they expounded on their experience. And, and, and really, I, I felt that it is, it is very, it's a very valid, and I, and I would hope that more and more Holocaust survivors would actually be able to do it, do it, and I know it's very expensive. I mean, I'm not shy to tell you that the pilot project that was done with me, the Shaw Foundation, had to raise $2.6 billion to actually do it, and it's done, you know, I worked over a period of two years because it was the pilot project and the whole uh, technology had to be, you know, devised and so forth and so on. But still, it's very expensive. So, but I, I feel that it's very, it's very important to, to have as many as possible, you know, to do it. I mean, uh, and, and I think the Shaw Foundation is doing a fantastic job in, in actually creating this. And, and, and Heather is the one who started it all. So, <laughs> so for me, for me and, but what actually stands out for me, the, 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 I mean, this is a personal thing. I was talking to a, I love sp speaking to children at the age of eight and nine, ten, because they, they are not self-conscious. When you speak to 15 years old in, in schools, then they are very kind of self-conscious and they, they don't ask questions. But the little ones are not shy at all, so they ask lots of questions. So one of them, a little boy got up, he was, he was, he didn't even look eight or nine, he was that high, and he said, did you ever meet Hitler? I said, no, but the question was very important. Why? Because it gave me an opportunity to actually not talk about my experiences, but talk to the class of about, they're from the school, they actually take a few classes over, there were about, about 160 you know, young people there, and I told them what Nazis is, what Hitler was all about. So every question that, you know, that I find is meaningful. But this, this kind of stands out in my mind how one leads to another from a little boy who's not Jewish. You know, most of these schools are go to our, our schools. There are maybe a few Jewish children, but they, they are out in the suburbs and places like that. And, uh, and, and that is very important to be able to actually do that. So one of my favorite stories about the interaction as it was getting tested is one that Heather tells about another little boy. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can share that with everyone. So one of my personal favorites. <laughs> so we were testing uh, new dimensions at the US Holocaust Museum over, the pa over last summer. And we were testing it in a different way than we had tested it for a couple years before that, um, just on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So anyone from the public that was visiting the museum could essentially come up just the way that um, we, they have it set up here and ask Pincus a question. So a little boy came up and with his parents, obviously very bright, very energetic, and he kind of observed a couple people asking Pincus questions. And then we said, would you like to ask a question? He came up and he said, okay. And so he asked him some basic questions that a lot of the, the system would probably, and any Holocaust survivor would get on any regular basis. And he was fine, and then they went away. About a half an hour later, um, and I don't know how many of you know this, but the, the core exhibition at USHMM is timed. So if you come to the museum and you want to see it, you normally have to wait until your time slot. So you have to mill around the museum and go to different things. So he comes back about 30 minutes later, and his mom says, he has another question. So he asked Pincus a question. So that's fine, OK. And then he leaves. And an hour and a half later, after they had gone through the core exhibit, he said to his mom as they were leaving the exhibit, mom, I have another question for Pincus. And so he came back to the exhibit, and he asked Pincus, 
did you ever want um, to retaliate? Did you ever want any, um, uh, what's the word? Revenge. Re revenge, revenge. So did you ever want any revenge? And Pincus answered him, and, and then um, he went away. But he was, it, it was unbelievable. He, he just kept going through the museum, kept thinking of different questions he wanted to ask him, and he insisted on coming back and asking the source, <laughs> you know, through the whole thing. It was great. I think one of the things we're seeing and we're starting to experience mm -hmm. here in the, the few short days that we've been open with mm -hmm. this installation is that people are doing something very similar. They mm -hmm. walk around, they have that experience, they come back, they ask you a question. We've also, uh, you'll have a chance if you haven't seen it yet to see it after. We're also premiering the testimony of Eva Schloss. It's, um, it's really quite interesting to watch the interactions and in some cases, unintentionally, there are interactions between Eva and Pincus. You can ask Eva a question, and Pincus is sitting there sort of nodding his head and agreeing. And in other cases, Pincus, Pincus broke into song for me this morning, and Eva first looked a little bit horrified, I have to say. And then she really got into it, and it was, it, it was wonderful. But I, I think the goal, and we're, we're still experiencing this and learning through this, but the goal is to get people to talk and to get people to ask and to get people to have an experience and, and see things in a way that they wouldn't. Uh, I'm not sure you intended this, and I look at Heather and, and certainly our thanks to Stephen Smith as well, um, but you've become an inspiration for people and I think you've become a little bit of the, uh, maybe an appropriate, a poster child for being able to tell this story in a way that really gets people to connect with with the history and feel connected to survivors, uh, perhaps in a way that they didn't think about. I've seen people get emotional in there. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to tell you something uh, to add to what you just said about the validity and all that. We have in Toronto, uh, we call it the, a speaker's bureau because the Holocaust survivors call them, you know, they speak and, you know, we have like a committee, but we call ourselves the Speaker's Bureau. And one day, the, not the present, but the previous chair of the, or the chief executive of the Holocaust Education Center decided to invite a professor from, I won't say from where, it's not important. I don't want to talk Lucian horror. <laughs> and, um, and, um, she was going to, so we, and she invited us to come because the speakers, she invited the speakers bureau, all the speakers that speak in public to schools, universities, go all over the world and do that, to come and listen to this professor. Okay, so we came, and we were quite a big crowd. And she started off by teaching us how to tell our story. So can you imagine that a, University professor who is a wonderful person, I'm sure, and who teaches well, but comes to tell the Holocaust survivors who experience something personal which is, which is impossible to actually understand and tell, tells them how to tell the story. And it was quite ludicrous the way she went on about it. And when Stephen approached me to become the pilot or the... the, the the pilot project for this, uh, in a way, is I thought to myself that one of the things that's going to happen in the future, and it's important, it's going to be mainly academia that's going to be teaching that. You're going to go to universities, you're going to, a lot of universities have now go, some of them have got masters and Holocaust education and so forth and so on. But Holocaust survivors are not going to be there. So, it is very important that there should be something like the hologram created by the Shoah Foundation in future that they can actually interact. Let's say not exactly with the person himself, but the person that was there and is there actually in a frame, you know, and almost embalmed, as you can say. I mean, it's a. It's a kind of, yeah. I'm terribly sorry. I, I, use, I use figures of speech quite often. So, you know, so, but, but anyway, you, you forgive me for me for, for that. But the fact is that basically I don't want 
I personally didn't want this to leave the story of the Holocaust to be purely academic. And I think this is one of the main reasons that I encourage other Holocaust survivors. There are many who won't tell their story. Many more, many hundreds of thousands of Holocaust survivors were not prepared to tell their story, were not prepared to re relive it. And, uh, it's, it's, and I think it's very important that we have the 50 or 1,000 that, and others from the Shaw Foundation you know, that, are, that exist and you can actually see them two-dimensionally, but at least you can actually hear their voice and see them talking about their story. Mm -hmm. Heather, what will success for this project look like five years from now? If we take a look back, huh. how will you view that? What would success in five years? Um, in five years, the accuracy rate should be um, almost perfect. <laughs> um, Is there a I goal think for it, how many survivors well, will participate? There's no, there's no end to, I mean, it's, it's just a resource. It's a matter of resources. Um, we originally, when we went out to do this project, we thought that there, we were shooting for 10, at least. And we have 13 now, so that was good. Um, there are a couple different aspects of the Holocaust story that I would still like to get. Um, for instance, we don't have anyone from, that was born in France and inexperienced. Um, we, we tried to get somebody from mostly every country that had a varying degrees you know, varying experiences throughout the Holocaust. But, um, you know, Holocaust survivors are still going to be around for a good five, ten years, you know, telling their story in museums. So the five years might not be my ultimate. I, I, I think my, my ultimate would be ten years down the road in... Every museum or institution that, that Holocaust survivors currently go into and are asked to go into. Because our, our theory, our working theory is Holocaust survivors have been asked to go into the public domain for the past 60 years, mostly 30, 35 for the most part, really in mass. And they're still asked to do it. So if they weren't being asked every day to go out at 85, 90 years old and speak to these, these kids in, in, in these institutions, in classrooms all over the world, then that, that in itself is important. It, it shows that those people that are asking them to do it have a, a reason for asking them. They, they see the value in them coming to, into their classrooms. They see the connection that these that these survivors are making with the with the kids. So, in order to fill that a little bit, that would be success. If it if it could fill some of that, some point. of it, yeah. So, Pincus, I've heard that uh, you've described this experience as somewhat of immortalizing your story. Can you respond to that? Is this, uh, I, I didn't you've described, I've heard that you've described the experience of participating in this, in New Dimensions, as uh, something to, that, that has really immortalized your story. Um, what is it, what is it that, what is it that makes you, um, uh, that makes you still come out to events like this, that gets you to still go and talk about why you've participated and why you're, you're joining with organizations like Shoah and with this museum and others to help continue telling your story. Uh, one, one of the main reasons is that my wife, Dorothy, she, she is the one who pushes me to do it. Oh. Thank you, Dorothy. <laughs> I, you know, I am, I'm, I'm getting old and tired. I'm at, the, at the moment, I have double vision because I don't know. I've got some, something happened, and I'm being treated for it. So I can, I can see everybody here. I, 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 you have twice the crowd because when I look at you, I actually you're get, not seeing I double. See, it's a really big audience. Really 
<laughs> I've, got, I've got twice the audience. So that's why I, I can see well with, with each one eye, but with two eyes, I can't see properly. So mm. it actually, it, it, Dorothy has been you know, very supportive and pushing me towards it. She feels it's very important. And that, um, so th that is the reason why I continue to, to do that. Because, to, to, listen, I've been 17 times in Poland and Germany taking groups of people, both on the March of the Living, March of Remembrance and Hope, which is purely for non, you know, from all the universities of postgraduate uh, uh, students from the universities of Canada. And, um, and, I, and I've been wanting to stop for quite some time. But every time I want to do that, even this afternoon, Dorothy says, but it's important. <laughs> So, so I have to go, I, I have to go, I, I continue doing it. And I really do believe that it is very important to go ahead because we are becoming frailer and a lot of people who would like to do it are not anymore able. For example, in Toronto, quite a few people that used to be very active are not talking anymore. So I think it, it's, it's very important for schools, universities and others to have a, a, a personal interaction with a Holocaust survivor and uh, you know, feel exactly what happened, especially when there's so much denying of it. You know, when there's today, even to this very moment, there is not a day where there's somebody doesn't come up on, on, on the internet or, or, or in, in public and says the Holocaust never happened, it didn't happen, that the gas chamber where it didn't exist, and so forth and so on. When I was that far away from the gas chamber in Majdanek, and it was a question of a, let, of, of a man in a white coat with a little, uh, you know, kind of stick, pushing you ref, left, right, left, right, left, right. And one way you're going to the guest chamber, the other way you go to the showers. And I didn't even realize that I was going to the showers. When I saw the showers, I knew in the Warsaw Ghetto, guests comes out of the showers, because we knew all about Treblinka. And I didn't know what was where and where we were and so forth and so on. So I said, my through and I said my prayers, and I was waiting for the guests to come out. Now, that's the type of thing that if you tell people you know, personally, you know, you, you, you can actually tell the story. And I think it's very important, especially with, with, with all the denying that is going on at the moment. And not only for that, but what is going on in the world at the moment, to avoid all the other atrocities, whether Jewish or non-Jewish. And I try and say that. It's not important. Who? Human beings should not be suffering, should, should not be tortured, should not be killed. When you see all these columns of Syrian refugees and others, it breaks your heart. So this is certainly a historical moment. I, I want to just pick up on one thing that um, Pincus said. Uh, really, our thanks to Dorothy, because uh, <laughs> we, we appreciate... <clears throat> We, we have a sense of what it means to, uh, to have our survivors take these stages over and over again, and the support of family is really crucial. And so we're, we're quite appreciative for what you're doing, Dorothy, and thank you. Uh, Pincus, Heather, it's been an honor to share the stage with you. We're gonna open it up to some questions, and um, we have a mic that is gonna pass around. Uh, so we're gonna, you're gonna bear with me for a moment. We're, we're gonna go to, uh, to this lady right over here first. So I have a question for you. In the, in the program for tonight, it said that you were participated in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And I just wondered if you could tell us a little about the uprising in, in Warsaw and what you were doing and you know how it happened. Can you repeat it because I don't hear so So it didn't, I'm sure it didn't say he participated in it. He was in the Warsaw Ghetto. He, to, he was in the Warsaw Ghetto during the uh, uprising, okay. she, she, and you, she wants to know what your experience was during the Warsaw Ghetto uprising. Um, what actually happened in the Warsaw Ghetto is that um, the, there wasn't, the uprising in April, air of Pesach, wasn't the first uprising. It started actually, the first you know, resistance was actually in January. But before that even, uh, we lived in buildings. Poland has got, you know, these tall buildings, you know, quadrangle with a with courtyard in the middle. And uh, the building that we lived in, I left in 1949 in Warsaw, the front of the building was destroyed. And people started, the, the, the 
kind of, there were official people still working for in the factories, and there were others, what they called hidden ones. So there were about 60,000, 50 or 60,000 Jews living in Warsaw, in the Warsaw Ghetto at the beginning of January. But before that, even, they started making bunkers. And underneath those ruins, where we, in 1949, where the first, the building was destroyed by a bomb in 39, they built a, it was Corner Mila. Mila is very famous where the headquarters of, of, of the resistance uh, was. Number 18 was, was where the big bunker was. So our, our building was Corner Mila and Nalevki. So there was an entrance in number three of uh, Mila and 49, and they built it underneath like a tunnel, and there were two rooms with the with a, with a middle and about 150 people. So we knew that things were going to get worse. And the telephones were still working in the Warsaw Ghetto right to the end. So they had resistance, Jewish resistance, living outside the ghetto and telling us and sending what's going to happen. On the 19th of April, Erev Pesach, early in the morning, the warning came the night before that the Nazis were coming to take everybody else out. And the resistance started. But in the meantime, it was Erev Pesach. So at 5 o'clock in the morning, my mother woke us up. And I always tell the story how important mother's love is. It, it actually breaks my heart when I think of it. When my mother was dressing the two children, we were 11 years old, she took and put on us two pairs of raituzi. Raituzi is, is, um, uh, is, tights. is like women, a, a woman's uh, tights, yes. except they're made from wool, and children used to wear it for winter so that we shouldn't get cold. She put two pairs, not one pair or two pairs. And then we went down to the bunker. And the one thing, another thing about the heroism that, that went on and the, 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 the belief in, in, in Jewish faith and the, everything else at the worst possible moment. We had a seder in the bunker. My father, who was a winemaker, obviously had, we used to make some wine in the world, so they brought down some wine and some baker made a few matzah and they were crying and the, these were Hasidic people. They knew the gada off by heart. So they were saying the gada in the bunker and people were being shot and killed and chased to, my, to, to Treblinka up on top there and buildings were being destroyed and, and burning. But we said the Seder in the bunker Erev Pesach of 1943. We have another question over here, Laura, if you, this gentleman. First of all, I want to say thank you to the museum. Okay, this is wonderful. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to you uh, for not only being who you are and giving us a testimony, but investing, I would imagine, countless numbers of hours with Heather uh, to make this project work. And I, I really appreciate that. Heather, I come from North Carolina, and in North Carolina, we would call you a shero. Okay, a shero is a female hero. Oh. Okay? <laughs> so uh, you really are. Thank you. Uh, just amazing, just amazing. Thank so. You. My question is not only to thank you for you, because you're a really cutting edge person, and uh, I've been teaching uh, Shoah for more than four decades. Uh, but how does this get to a kid in Calgary or Phoenix or in Greensboro, North Carolina or in Tallahassee, Florida? Is this only something that will be in major cities where there's major museums? Or what's your plan for distribution, if any? So, um, it, it, you're a history teacher? Yeah. yeah? Okay. Um, the USC Shoah Foundation has a game-changing platform called Eyewitness for teachers. They reach over 15 million students all around the world through this platform. Um, it, the plan is eventually when it's possible. Right now, it's not. Um, we're working on it. But it's an, again, it's another research project. Um, but it, it shortly, in a couple years maybe, 
will be able to be online. And so all 13 survivors could be used in, the, in a classroom scenario. You could envision being able to see their testimony on the show of foundation, and the kids then would be able to ask them questions um, and pick which one they want to talk to, et cetera. So that's ultimately the plan. Um, but it's going to take a little bit of work <laughs> to get it there. I was first introduced to the project in the yeah. lobby of the Grand Hyatt Hotel on Stephen's laptop. laptop. <laughs> and I will tell you. We had to go, we had to go from room to room we to, had try to try and to find, find Wi-Fi. We had to try to find Wi-Fi. <laughs> Once we found Wi-Fi, we found Pincus. And the, it, it, not having funny. that dimensionality to it, was equally striking. Yeah. I must have spent 40 minutes standing there having a conversation with a man I got to meet many months later, mm -hmm. and it only continues to get better. So I'm really quite hopeful that what Show is doing is going to help take this, push it out, get it in classrooms. Laura, we had a, a gentleman in the back who had his hand up before, so we're going to take his question. Oh, yeah. sir, we're going to take you after. We're going to go to the one just behind you. Thank us. <laughs> My name is Dick Terrell, I'm from Fort Worth, Texas. I would like to know what your experience was like at the end of the war. For a year or two, did, were you just an orphan? What happened? Tell us about that. Um, really shortly. I know. I, 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 yeah, I, I, you know, the gentleman speaks quite clearly, and uh, okay. and I hear from I hear on this side better than this side. Okay. <laughs> so. Um, no, no, what actually happened was um, we, were, we were shipped to Buchenwald in December or January from, a, from an iron steel factory in, in, in uh, Częstochowa from, in Poland. Um, and uh, Buchenwald at that time was an incredible, terrible place because not only nobody went to work, but they didn't give you any food. And um, the, the conditions were, uh, it, it was winter, and it, it was just people were actually dying in front of you. I mean, when we, we would wake up in the morning, we lived about a thousand in a barrack, uh, there would be 40, 50 people who died during the night. So it was very terrible. But fortunately, and again, as far as I'm concerned, to me, that's providence. The factories that we worked for in Poland were looking for us, and they found us in Buchenwald. So they took us to a place called Kolditz, where we were making Panzerfaust. I don't know if you, but Panzerfaust was a, a German bazooka, an anti-tank bazooka, which they were making there. And we didn't, it wasn't a camp, it was a factory, and they converted one of the holes where they put bunks in that they used to lock us in at night. And we were there from about the end of, uh, I think, January until the beginning of April. And as the Americans were coming from one side, they were decided, I don't know why the death marches, nobody really knows, understands why they had these death marches. Some people say because they wanted to concentrate everybody in Theresienstadt and, 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 and murder everybody there, but I'm not quite sure. But at around about beginning or middle of April, they closed the camp and they started marching us out. And we started marching. In the beginning, they gave us some food for the journey. But after two days, the food was gone. So we walked. We were 1,500 of us that left that camp. And we were walking through Germany. We went through Dresden after the, uh, Dresden was bombed by that. It was still burning. And then we walked to, towards the Czech border. And then we crossed the border. And we finished up in Theresienstadt. By the time we arrived in Theresienstadt, there were only 750 of us left. Half, half of the people that left Kolditz were, you know, were, were, were either died of a natural death or were murdered by the Nazi guards. What was interesting is that while we were walking through, it was the end of the war, while we were walking through Germany, 
We were vilified to such an extent you cannot imagine. The, the, I'm, I'm talking about the civilian population. They would throw stones. If we went through a village or something like that, they would throw stones at us, you know, shout, and, 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 the, and the guards had to keep them a, aside. The moment we crossed the border into Czechoslovakia, the, the windows opened and they started you know, throwing food for us. And the Nazi guards were shooting with their machine guns in the air, stopping them from doing that. And they said, if you continue doing that, we're going to kill you. So that's what happened, the difference between Germany and, and Czechoslovakia as you went through from one country to another. I, there's, a, there's one story that I very rarely tell because it's quite impossible to understand what happened. When we were close to the Czech border, and a lot of us had already been killed, a high German officer dressed in all in black with, with, with all medals and shining and like if he would came out from a parade on a motorbike. He stopped the column. Uh, the, our guards were disheveled and actually elderly ones. And he stopped the column, stood on the bike, put the bike, you know, on the one side, stood on the bike, on the, se on the seat of the bike, and he said, from now on, you are all kameraden, and you are not to die. So if anybody can't walk, four people have to carry him, and nobody is going to be shot, and nobody is going to be killed. And then he just drove away. That was the end of that. So, of course, the guards, when they got order from a high officer, they didn't shoot anybody. Some people still died on the way. But people started saying either he was a resistance guy or he was a Malach Menashemayim. We didn't know what happened. But I want to tell you that quite a few people were actually saved because of this particular happening just before we crossed the border into Czechoslovakia. And when we got to uh, Theresienstadt, uh, we got some food, and we were there for a short while. And on the 8th of May, we were liberated by the Russian army. And uh, that was, you know, and, uh, liberation was one thing, but you, you, it, it, it's, I always, people ask me, so what happened if you were liberated? What were you feeling? And I said, and I say to myself, it was the beginning of your Calvary. You were, you, 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 were, you were alone in the world. You, you had gone through five years of hell, and you were here, but so what, what, what's going to happen? Nobody knew, and you were really... Uh, it, it, took a, it took a few days, and a, few de a little while, to actually come to terms that you are now not... that something is going to happen different than what was going on today, especially when you were a child of 13 years old, and you didn't understand as much as what you know, uh, grown up, you know, uh, uh, adults understand. Uh, Martin Gilbert, so Martin Gilbert, who passed away recently, uh, wrote a book, The Last Day of the War, and he published, he, wrote, he published in newspapers, if you know, remember what happened to you on the 8th of May of 1945, please tell me the story. And I remembered I was well enough to be able to run out and to see what was happening the day that we were liberated. So I ran out, and what I saw, what, 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 what I actually witnessed was Russian soldiers marching, tanks and others, and the Czechs were expelling the Sudeten Germans or the Germans that were settled by Hitler in Sudeten Germany. So they were schlepping with the Peklach and mostly old men, women with children. And I want to tell you something that I felt sorry for them. I actually felt empathy because to me, they were human beings walking and suffering. And, and then when I kind of spoke to some of my friends that actually came with me, and they said, yes, we, we understand that. They, they said, but you know, you know that after all, they're Germans. I said, but they're also human beings. And this is something that has kind of stayed with me all the time, that you know, I, I, cannot, I cannot support suffering of any human person. I feel that, hum that to be a human being, you, you have to act differently. You have to do something different. And that is why I get so pained when I see the pictures today on, on television, what's going on at the world at the moment.
we are, uh, we are unfortunately out of time, so we're going to end with that. Pincus, again, really, truly an honor on behalf of all of us here at the museum. I think we had uh, an opportunity to introduce you to some new friends, and we're really quite grateful that you're with us. And Heather, it's been a pleasure working with you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you to Pincus. <laughs>